since I last spoke. So I'm Craig Clifton from Jacobs, and I uh, and as I just spoke, uh, you'll see a, a a note going across your screens there that this. Uh, Presentation is being recorded um, and that will be available to uh, participants and others who couldn't join the meeting. Just a reminder, and which I think everyone's done that, is if you could set your microphone to mute and if you'd like to send a message or a question, just use the, um, there's a little, should be a little um, voice box uh, when you um, Put your mouse or touch your screen, and you can send a message to that. Kristen Moss, who's working with me, who's worked with me on the project, will capture those questions, and we'll either address them if they're urgent questions as we go through the presentation, or at the end. So, and thanks too for Intelligent Water Networks um, for sort of hosting the uh, the conversation today and to Kate Brunt who's the uh, project manager from Goldman Broken CMA for uh, sending out the invitations and for the, uh, her networks. What I want to do uh, is before we sort of get into the presentation is just introduce the team so just so in case you don't know us the team so the presentation today will be given by myself from Jacobs and Kristen Moss who's worked with me on the project and really wanted to acknowledge a couple of groups, our project steering committee, Kate Brunt from Goldwyn Broken CMA, Chris Pitfield from Corangamite CMA, Adam Hood and Jill Fagan from DELP and also the most of the presentation will be about a case study that we did um, with Wan and Water, Corangamite and Glenelg Hopkins CMA and I'd uh, just like to acknowledge uh, that working group, particularly uh, Julie Risman from um, Wan and Water who um, helped facilitate this uh, or suggested this um, presentation through Intelligent Water Networks and was a sort of project lead from Wan and Water. Also would like to acknowledge that the project's been funded through by DELP through their Our Catchment, Our Communities program. So what we're going to talk about today, I'll give an overview of the catchment carbon offsets trial, which is sort of the, I guess the the big trial that or the the project that was funded by DELP. Talk about this concept of catchment carbon offsets, which was developed through the project, and then spend most of the presentation on a case study in which we developed and tested this concept based on a particular idea. Uh, through Wan and Water and Coringamite CMA, which was worked out in the Jellybrand River catchment. Share some things that we learned through the process and very briefly talk about some, some possible next steps. And as I sort of said at the start, if anyone has any questions, then please uh, use the message box on your um, Skype screen. And uh, if, you've, if this isn't coming through clearly, also use that just to send Kristen a message and we may be able to do something about it. This is the, our first uh, opportunity to use Skype for business for a sort of a broadcast type webinar. So we've tested it a couple of times and seems to be working okay, but ho and hopefully that will continue through the rest of today. Okay, so I'll go on to talk about the catchment carbon offsets trial. Now the project came; it's, the pro genesis for the project was really in Water Vict for Victoria, the uh, the state's water plan. It, it spoke the discussion paper and the subsequent plan spoke about a role. As uh, in in the uh, in the sort of climate change component of that project, the climate change mitigation pro component, a role for water sector collaborative projects which offset emissions and provide relevant environmental benefits, and that sort of concept was sort of taken up in this project to to develop this trial, which would demonstrate how carbon offsets projects might similar simultaneously deliver those four things. Emissions reductions, um, particularly as offsets for intractable emissions from water corporations, namely those associated with um, em fugitive emissions from wastewater treatment plants, um, but also that how the project might be able to 
deliver climate resilience, better catchment health and good alignment between regional NRM plans and water sector emissions abatement. Now for those not sort of closely aligned with CMAs, uh, you may or may not know that each of the CMAs has developed a, a climate change plan which is sort of looking to build climate resilience in, the, in each of the, the CMA's catchments and also trying to integrate that with um, opportunities to, um, to sequester carbon in landscapes. And overall the project's trying to complement a host of Victorian government policies uh, relating to climate change mitigation and adaptation, so the Climate States Climate Change Framework, uh, the Climate Change Adaptation Plan, linking with the net zero emissions by 2050, which is the state's emissions goal, as well as policies and programs relating to catchment management, water resource management, biodiversity. And one of the key parts of the, the, the trial at least, and really the catchment carbon offsets concept as well, was that it might help to strengthen collaborative relationships within the water sector. And so a number of activities were undertaken as part of the trial to, to facilitate that. The project was undertaken in four stages, um, involving sort of consultation with the project steering committee, with uh, stakeholder groups and with the uh, working group from the um, from the particular case study. So the first stage was really about trying to get our head, heads around what the concept was about because you know, the, the term essentially had been invented so we started to think about what that might mean. That was developed in a, in a bit of background work we did which was presented to a, a stakeholder workshop um, in uh, I think February or March last year. Then we went, did some work to sort of further develop this concept, was meant, what might be meant by the catchment carbon offsets project and then we undertook the case study and the case study was the main sort of activity of the project uh, and it was about sort of trying to test the concepts, see whether they would have practical application and develop tools that would help to design and evaluate project, evaluate catchment carbon offset projects um, should the concept seem, appear to have legs after the, the initial case study. A couple of points in which we ran stakeholder workshops in stage two and at the end of the, the case study process. And there's a, a range of outputs um, from the, 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 uh, the project. Uh, and all of which are, are sort of available to people who might be interested in that. So the, the case study report and the final project report have, have been completed and, and are available for any interested parties if you don't already have them. And we've, we have developed some uh, tools to support um, further catchment carbon offset projects. Um, Although at the moment, and we've just sort of applied for some funding to try and develop those tools that they are not so closely aligned with the, the particular case study that we did so, and might be more useful to others undertaking similar sorts of projects. So the, as I was saying before, it's sort of the, the, the term catchment carbon offsets was in a sense coined for this project, although you know, many of the aspects weren't really new, I guess there's been a lot of interest in this concept of multi-benefit carbon offsets since people have been talking about carbon offsets. But you know, through the work deliberations with the case study and the, particularly the initial stakeholder workshop, we came up with these sort of concepts which we felt were the key characteristics or principles of catchment carbon offsets. Um, I won't go through all of those but included various elements there about increasing landscape carbon stocks but very importantly you know, resulting in real additional emissions, uh, real and additional reductions in atmospheric CO2 which means that the carbon sequestration had to be credibly, uh, credible, able to be quantified and verified using appropriate methodologies. The aim was, is that that carbon actually is permanently sequestered in the landscape which embodies a couple of things. One is that it's stable and resilient with climate change, also that there is its own, it, it can be owned and protected from changes in policy and um, property ownership. As I was saying the projects are about multi-benefit catchment 
multi-benefit offsets projects. So the intent is that the projects would provide a range of benefits. The initial focus was on environmental benefits, but in the the, uh, the first stakeholder workshop, it became obvious that the water corporations also had important sort of social and cultural objectives, and so that range of, of benefits were also included into the mix. And and of course, you know, well. Similarly, uh, yes, per the water corporations, CMAs themselves have uh, have social and cultural objectives too, and so it's trying to align that range of benefits with the, the objectives of the various organisations and also with government policy. It's really important, and I'll take the, the sort of next point about project benefits and outcomes, but that the non-carbon benefits associated with a project were visible. Um, they could be defined and they were relatively certain. So the intent was where possible to quantify those things, but certainly that it would be a methodology would be developed whereby those things would be a narrative around them would be developed and that the evaluation of the, the projects might actually incorporate those other environmental or social benefits. And, and certainly for this initial phase, the intent was that these projects be be linked to stable and longer term relationships between within the water sector between CMAs and water corporations. Although the model potentially has an application outside of, of the water sector. Uh, the idea was that the, the projects be local to water corporations and CMAs. And certainly the, the concept is a is a and, and consistent with the statements of obligations on emissions reductions for the water corporations. These are about projects that would be undertaken within Victoria uh, and, and very much not looking at sort of least cost abatement, um, but looking at high value abatement opportunities within Victoria that achieve the range of benefits that uh, have, are uh, in this slide. And also that the projects would actually be scalable up and down. Obviously, there'd be a minimum size of project that would be consistent with the uh, the sort of quantification rules um, for uh, you know for um, offsets. Um, but that's that's a pretty low bar, only 0.2 of a hectare. But to achieve the sort of environmental and other social benefits that the project is looking at, obviously obviously needs to be at a reasonable size. So these were the key characteristics of the catchment carbon offsets and we checked back in on those as we sort of went through the project and, and they, as I'll sort of say later at the, in conclusion, they, they seem to be, be quite robust. The project speaks, spoke about two models of catchment carbon offset a certified model and a flexible model. The certified being one where the carbon's measured, verified in compliance with the National Carbon Offset Standard or some other applicable standard. Um, and the offsets could actually be certified. And, and that's the sort of concept, the model that's consistent with our water corporation statements of obligations for emissions reduction. We also introduced this concept of a flexible model. We thought there may be some place, some scope where you would want to think about projects or at least parts of projects where the carbon's measured or estimated using credible methodologies, but where you don't go down that process for a, a formal sort of certification. So it's potentially, you know, they would be measured using credible methods, but not necessarily going through a verification process. And we thought, thought that this might have applications in a number of ways, particularly having a, a lower transaction costs, um, not needing this sort of verification and auditing process that's required for um, uh, certified offsets, particularly if they are go through that crediting process. But also there, there may be other opportunities in there and we'll, we'll come back to, to that a, a bit later on because that, that concept of the flexible model developed a bit as the, the case study was undertaken. But regardless of whether they would be certified or flexible, any kind of catchment carbon offset project would be um, one that would deliver the core catchment carbon offset characteristics from the previous slide, particularly that, that multi-benefit collaborative model uh, seen as essential features of that. Now the project is concerning, essentially concerning land sector carbon offsets and there's a number of ways in which they might be generated, green carbon projects, blue, brown and agricultural emissions avoidance projects and the definitions of them. And, and so at the start of the process we're interested in how do these sort of ideas fit with the, the concept of catchment carbon offsets as we've defined. 
Um, Kristen, can I just check in with you that the slides are moving through because I've got this on my phone and uh, nothing's happening. Uh, they're moving through for me, yes. It's on the options for generating catchment carbon offset slide. Okay, wonderful. Can That's anyone good. else confirm that they can see it from off the network? Yeah, I can see that as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. Good. I had a shocking thought for a moment that it wasn't working for people. Okay. We'll keep going, assuming that it's good. So we, so we, so we had this concept of models, and then uh, this concept of op options for generating catchment carbon offsets. And these essentially are the methodologies that might be used to generate certified offsets and potentially flexible offsets. Our focus initially was on green carbon options because they seem to be intrinsically the things that were most likely to coincide with the, the sort of the definitions of catchment carbon offsets. We're also interested in, in this concept of blue carbon, so that's carbon stored in marine and aquatic ecosystems. Um, although the, at the moment the methodologies for these are, are quite limited and, and the, the property rights around them are also a, a bit limited as well. We went through and, and looked at the various options that are available and essentially these are methodologies available under the Emissions Reduction Fund and the various uh, other sort of carbon offsetting frameworks that, that are can be accepted under the National Carbon Offset Scheme. Looked at their appropriateness to the, the model, their effectiveness in, in achieving these things and the sorts of legacies, whether they would actually achieve the types of legacies that we're looking at for these kinds of projects. And essentially we came down, we, we decided that um, agricultural emissions, emissions avoidance projects by themselves didn't provide enough of those sort of environmental or social benefits to be consistent with the concept. And while we saw soil or brown carbon projects conforming with some of the key characteristics, the projects themselves are mostly about sort of um, changing agricultural practices um, and while there are clear soil health benefits and some potential for catchment health benefits. Again, we thought that the the, um, the scope of the benefits wasn't sufficient for those projects on their own to, to be considered as catchment carbon offsets. Now, within the green carbon options, the methodologies there capture uh, soil carbon that's sequestered as part of those systems. And as we'll see in the case study, we did incorporate uh, think, some thinking around agricultural emissions avoidance in part of the sort of the benefit stream of the overall project. But we didn't think that the projects that were by themselves agricultural emissions avoidance projects or um, soil carbon projects would actually st stack up as catchment carbon offsets. And you can see there's a range of uh, methodologies for the green carbon projects there. As you might expect, new environmental plantings, um, environmental plantings that would be established through managed natural regeneration. Non-environmental planning, so that's that ranges, you know, includes pretty much anything that's not the the establishment of locally indigenous native species, and there's a couple of other options around uh, avoidance of legally permitted clearing or avoidance of planned and permitted native forest harvesting, and those latter two have some perhaps a bit more limited scope. The the latter really only at any scale uh, taking place on in state forests, in public land areas, and probably not really the scope of what we're consistent with what we're looking at there. And because of the extensive historical clearing taking place in Victoria and the planning, you know, the controls on clearing, not a lot of land that's actually where clearing is legally permitted and, and so not much scope for that uh, that fourth dot point and, and and that source of avoidance of legally permitted clearing is the main source of green carbon offsets under the ERF uh, the emissions reduction fund at the moment but those most of that work is is Queensland and and northern New South Wales so there were the, the things we looked at to, to consider the options and uh, the focus of the case study came down to those three top um, green carbon options. We, while there was a lot of interest in blue carbon projects, because particularly for the 
particularly for the coastal CMAs, but not just the coastal CMAs, and, and some of the water corporations. You know, there's a, a strong alignment between their interest in this concept of blue carbon, but at the moment, under the Emissions Reduction Fund, there are no actual methodologies. There is a way under the, the NCOS, but the, the, the process of property rights and, and quantifying these things is still at a there's still probably a couple of years off before that is uh, is really something that that can take off. So in time, blue carbon options may fit into this concept of catchment carbon offsets, but it's probably a bit early at this stage to to see that happening. And so we focused on those three methods, the, those three options that are flagged at the top of that um, slide. So I'd like to to turn uh, our attention now to the the case study that. Uh, we ran, which essentially was the fourth stage of the project and the main project activity. As I said, it was a collaborative venture between uh, Wanna Water, Karangamite CMA and Glenelg Hopkins CMA, um, with the main parties involved, but also some involvement too from um, the Centre for E Research and Digital Innovation at uh, Federation Uni. So we were in a because there was the the scope for a number of parties to be interested in. There, we thought, in fairness, we should run a uh, an expression of interest process, and essentially we asked uh, interested parties to to present a brief proposal, explaining some of those things there. And we went through a process with the, the steering committee where they were evaluated. Uh, we had six responses, and and a case study was selected from which was led by one and water. And, and the description of that case study will be you know, the main thing that we'll, I'll be speaking about in the remainder of the presentation. The case study's objectives were really around designing a project that would improve drinking water quality and river health in a, in a key drinking water supply and catchment management area, the, the Jelly Brand River catchment, while at the same time generating carbon offsets that would potentially um, Meet, satisfy part or a significant component of one and water's offset requirements, and which they appeared to be sort of ballpark figure around about um, 7,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalents per annum. Um, have, once one and water ad adopted the, the range of other emissions uh, reduction energy, renewable energy projects. The case study also had a number of specific objectives relating to you know, which were the sort of ideas of, of people involved in the in the working group, and one one of the sort of features of it was building in um, th this involvement with um, Surti from Federation Uni, with the idea of potentially developing some other some sort of tools, uh, web-based uh, platform that uh, others in, interested in catchment carbon offset projects in the future might be able to use, that may help them to to design and develop. Uh, their own project. Uh, the case study, so the location of the um, jelly brand catchment is, is indicated in that slide. So it included um, the upper catchment of the jelly brand river above the Otway South offtake. Um, the f pictures giving an exam, you know, showing some of the catchment conditions. Looking at the map, I guess one of the, the key features of that is that. The, the catchment is extensively forested, um, but most of the clear land has uh, dairy farming in it, and on much of that sort of cleared agricultural land, livestock have pretty much free access to the catchment, uh, to the waterways, and so you've got an issues with, uh, as you might expect in that sort of context, with livestock with sediment and nutrients and uh, pathogens finding their way into the waterways. So the the, um, the case study was, uh, if you can see it, this sort of upper part above the uh, South Barn Water South Otway offtake, and that is a, a key source of uh, drinking water for Warrnambool and uh, and some surrounding towns. The catchment also has um, a number of, uh, you know, as you can see that the darker greens are areas of. Uh, a plantation, mostly uh, softwood plantation. One of the things that we used in this project was this uh, fish, what we call a fishbone diagram, which is really trying to th helping think about what are the causes and effects of uh, problems. 
Um, it doesn't have to look like that. It's just used for illustration. But you know, what this does is illustrate what the you know the problem that the project was designed to achieve. In addition to um, providing the carbon offsets, and as I said before, it was about addressing poor water quality issues in the jelly brand catchment. Though the causation of those related to four main factors: the access of stock to waterways, in-stream erosion partly due to the stock access, the um, nutrient point sources which provided a, another source of nutrients and, and contaminants that may find their way into waterways and overland, overland flows which would uh, carry either sediments or nutrients into, into those waterways. And poor water quality in that catch in the in the Jelly Band River in the catchments reflected in a number of features, E. coli, high turbidity sediments, high nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, cryptosporidium and giardia. So a range of issues requiring that that, that water in that catchment um, be treated. And part of the you know one of the options being considered in the project was how might a catchment the the impact of a catchment carbon offset kind of project. Uh, Compare with an engineered uh, water treatment solution, whereby the water in the in the five treatment plants downstream of the the offtake, um, what, what, how might the the water treated using UV, uh, what would be the costs and the, and the benefits associated with that? So the design responses to to each of those causes, um, pretty standard sort of um, catchment based uh, management type of concept, uh, excluding stock from waterways so that they can't get access to them, can't disturb the soils, provide off-stream watering so the stock aren't required to access the streams for, for watering purposes and then to revegetate that riparian zone. Uh, again, the overlaying flows addressed through stock exclusion and through establishment of vegetation um, and understory that may filter uh, overland flows in that uh, riparian zone and through the development of wider buff riparian buffers potentially pushing the dairy effluent systems further away from the um, from the rivers and, and reducing the amount of nutrient um, finding their way into the streams. So that was the sort of the design responses focused on that particular cause of the issue, poor water quality. Um, and, and what did that look like in terms of the catchment? So this is just a, a you know a snapshot of parts of the catchment. The the pale green being the existing uh, native vegetation, the darker green being plantations, and then the the brown uh, being various forms of catchment carbon offset. So we have three basic sort of configurations. The middle slide is a, a 20 meter waterway buffer, so that's 20 meter planting on each side of the waterways. On the left-hand side, it's a 100 metre buffer where the buffer, rather than being 20 metres, is 100. The 20 metres was considered to be the sort of minimum necessary to achieve the kinds of it, ben, um, water quality and other environmental and, and potentially social benefits from the project. 100 metres was picked as what might be the sort of plausible upper limit of what might be possible in that catchment, but recognising that you would, unlike most Unlikely to to achieve 100 metres uh, of revegetation across the, the catchment area, given the amount of change that that would cause to agricultural land use. Uh, and then on the right hand side of the screen, a 20 metre buffer along all of the waterways, plus planting out all of the areas that would be included in the you know, the one percent or the one in a hundred year flood way uh, flood. Um, so it's essentially identifying the floodplain areas. Now, the, the main configuration was those being established with new environmental planting, so new plantings with locally indigenous native species. We did also consider farm forestry options for the 100 metre and the floodplain options where there was a 20 metre uh, environmental planting buffer in every situation and either the remaining area, either the 80 metres or the uh, the remainder of the floodplain planted up to high carbon potential species, so farm forestry species and in in the, the modelling of the, the um, carbon plantings we're thinking about blue gums as being that option. 
And so what does that look like in the catchment? This is showing the, the four main subcatchments of the uh, upstream of the uh, Otway South offtake, total area, the amount of existing native vegetation, the existing agricultural land, and how much uh, was taken up by those new plantings. So the 20 metre buffer essentially occupied an additional 720 hectares, you know, roughly 10% of the agricultural land in the catchment. Uh, the 100 metre buffer would occupy about 40, 40 to 50% of the agricultural land in the catchment, and the, the floodplain, 20 metres plus floodplain option, around about sort of 20% or so of, of the catchment area. So depending on the option, you know, you know, potentially relatively achievable with the 20 metre buffer, really hard to get that sort of land use change in a catchment with a 100 metre buffer. Um, but noting that much of the catchment is 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 already forested with plantations or, or native vegetation, so we're but nonetheless um, with a relatively small proportion of agricultural land, still su some significant water quality issues. So the project was designed to have a legacy around water quality, but it was also designed to have other kinds of legacies, and and recognising that in doing uh, the sorts of things that uh, was were proposed in the case study, recognising that it was a, a virtual case study, so we designed a project, it hasn't yet been carried through to implementation. Um, there, there are potentially some sort of adverse legacies associated with that as well. So the so you know we designed the project to have these legacies and created an evaluation framework by which we could try and understand what the, the, the nature of those legacies would be. And the, the legacies fell into a number of categories, emissions, water, um, socioeconomic values and biodiversity, each having a number of aspects. Now the intent would be and was that we would evaluate as many of those as was actually reasonable to do so and that each of those might be included at least in, in part of the narrative around the, around the project. You notice a couple of the, you know, so a, a contrast between the legacies between green and red. Most of the legacies of the project being seen to be beneficial, um, but also the possibility putting, you know, for example, uh, of negative legacies, legacies such as um, putting vegetation back into a landscape, that having potential to intercept water, reducing water flows. Uh, the establishment of the plantings would lead to emissions associated with fuel use, so it may increase a little bit above some aspect of the agricultural uses, but overall potentially having legacies around the sequestration of carbon, but also on agricultural emissions as well, and a range of biodiversity and, and sort of uh, socioeconomic values as well. And we'll go into sort of some details of those in a, in a minute. So one of the things that we did was develop an evaluation framework, looking at the various options, so the, the planting type options, the riparian buffers, floodplain buffers, also looking at a base case which were involved essentially doing nothing more within the catchment to address the, the source water quality issues, and then the engineered water quality, water quality treatment, a new project to introduce UV treatment into those five treatment plants. Now the evaluation framework considers the financial costs and benefits relative to the base case denominated in dollars and then discounted over a 50 year project life and, and the environmental benefits, all again all relating back to a change uh, to a rel value relative to the base case un under its current, uh, current situation. So this framework allows, to, allows us to identify the best financial option. Uh, and also identify, you know, if there are suboptimal financial options, um, see whether you know the values associated with the non-financial benefits may justify their selection. And so that it provides a model uh, that can be used where you've got sort of a mixed evaluation where you can denominate some things in dollars. Uh, and do that, that sort of rigorous financial analysis, but you've got other uncertain other information that you can draw on to help make a decision. And, and recognising that many decisions are, are structured in this way, that where there's a clear financial basis to the decision, but can, uh, other features that, you know, used in a, in a triple bottom line process. So I'll just hand over to, to 
Kristen in a moment, and she'll take us through the first couple of steps in the, the financial uh, in the financial analysis and describe how the, they were done. Just you know, recognizing first we we looked at you know who the costs and benefits were for, and noting that they could be attributed in different ways, but that was just for for information. You know, essentially the it didn't matter who in in terms of adding up the numbers, it didn't really matter to where they were attributed. The key thing was that we didn't uh, double count costs and benefits, and we considered the range of uh, costs and benefits that are described there. So, Kristen, I'll hand over you to to you to sort of uh, take us through the next few slides. Thank you, Craig. I'll just see if I can take control of the presentation. Can you give me control? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, so, can I move forward onto the next slide? It might just be easier. Sorry, Craig, if you just move on to the next slide. Thanks. So, for the financial analysis, um, we calculated how much, well, we started by actually calculating how much carbon would be sequestered in each of the project options over the 50 year time frame and um, rate of increase and when that peaked. We used that to calculate things like um, carbon credits. So the financial analysis can show when the project costs and incomes would be incurred and received for each project option. So you see on this particular example, there's very high establishment costs, but they drop right off after the first five years of project establishment. So um, and then they're just quite low project maintenance um, and project um, management. Every five years, there's a bit of a peak in costs where you're monitoring and doing your calculation, uh, your carbon accounting to engage with the carbon market. And then the, every five years, there's those big spikes in income, which is gained from selling the carbon revenue. So that first example is from the 20 meter riparian buffer, all environmental planting um, example. Uh, the next one, please, Craig. So for the 100 metre project, you can see that the ongoing ongoing costs are still quite high. It's because for this project, we assume that there was a, fail, a very high opportunity cost associated with um, taking up prime agricultural land and putting trees on it. So you can see there's still, you're getting income from the carbon credits, but they don't come anywhere close to matching the costs incurred from, uh, from not, not doing dairy farming. Um, next one. Whereas in contrast, if you've got the farm forestry option, yeah, there's a small spike around the 10 year mark where you um, you get your carbon credits for planting the high, high value carbon trees. But then every 15 years when you're harvesting, replanting and selling the, um, the pulp wood, then you get a much higher income. So yeah, the financial, the financial analysis allows us to see yeah, the performance over time, and you can see as it decreases over the uh, over the lifespan of the project, that is the effect of the discounting. Next slide, please. So, how do they stack up in comparison with each other? So, the green bars are the costs. So, uh, sorry, net present value. So, that is project um, benefits minus project costs. You can see they are all negative. None of these projects <laughs> make you money if you're just looking at the financial aspects of it. Um, we're comparing the what we have the water treatment plant option. Sorry, the UV upgrade to the water treatment plant option there for comparison with the other options. And you can see the 20 meter environmental planting projects actually quite cheap, particularly compared to the 100 meter environmental planting project, which is very expensive. Um, the this analysis assumed a carbon price of 11 dollars per ton. But we also calculated what the carbon price would need to be for each of these projects to break even. The lowest is the 20 metre project, which has would break even at a carbon price of $51. And the highest is actually the, um, the floodplain environmental planting at nearly three times that amount. Uh, click. However, if you separate out the costs of running the project as a carbon project, being the verification and the income from the carbon sale, from the business as usual costs, being buying seeds, labour, fencing, that sort of thing, 
we find that the projects actually make money in in that viewpoint of it. So this means that for, say for the 20 metre project, for a $200,000 outlay over the course of the project lifespan, it will bring in 1.2 million. So running the project as, running the tree planting project as a carbon project brings in 100 million, uh, sorry, $1 million over the project lifespan. So if I can just add to that, the comment that Kristen made there, just to, to reinforce that point, if, if business as usual you were designing a project to address the catchment health issues, then um, this, you know, essentially by making the, the project a carbon project where you, you, you're even at $11 per tonne of CO2e, then that's making your million dollars net present value over the 50-year the life of the project. So, it, you know, adding that carbon component into these, you know, what are business as usual environmental style projects for CMAs does actually make quite a difference. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Do you want me to talk to this one, Kristen, and you go on to the... Yes. The, um, Yes, please. Emissions off. So we, we developed a, a sort of a, uh, an, an analysis framework for the, looking at the various environmental benefits. We considered the, the criteria that, that are there, greenhouse gas emissions, source water quality, river health and so on. And so, you know, so part of the, the narrative was, you know, so the narrative around the emissions offsets were captured within the financial aspect of the project. We also wanted to be able to tell the story of how, given that, the, you know, one of the underlying themes of this was how, it was about carbon offsets, carbon sequestration. We also wanted to calculate overall how much carbon might be sequestered or emissions avoided across the project. And while there, there was no double counting in the, the actual financial analysis and in the, in the overall reporting, we did want to be able to, as part of the narrative, the project capture, capture that information. We, so, so the, the carbon sequestered by the new environmental plantings, which would be certifiable, as I said, were included in the financial analysis. But emissions associated, avoided emissions associated with the displacement of dairy production and reduced emissions from the water treatment plant, existing water treatment plants, because they weren't running as hard, because the water quality would improve with the project. They were included in in what we identified from this project as the flexible emissions offsets, offsets that were real but wouldn't be part of a, a sort of a certifiable uh, offset that would be consistent with uh, water corporation statements of obligations. We also considered climate resilience as an attribute but feel, felt that you know, the way in which we're looking at these other environmental benefits from water quality, river health, biodiversity, a lot of the way in which that was framed was were in things that would actually, uh, that, that would be ways in which you'd frame climate resilience. So given that, we didn't want to double count and so we recognised that climate resilience is a feature of that part of the narrative of the project but wasn't formally included in the, in the uh, analysis framework. Kristen, back to you. Yes, so in terms of um, the real and uh, real reductions in atmospheric carbon dioxide that would were part of our key characteristics of the catchment carbon offsets. Um, so the project would assist with this through environmental plantings or the farm forestry, environmental plantings in the 20 metre buffer, environmental plantings or farm forestry on the project area outside of that buffer. But also for our larger projects, we assumed that they would be forcing um, cattle off that area so they wouldn't be burping. Um, and they would have, we could claim, or not, we could measure that reduction in reduced agricultural emissions. Uh, click. Yeah. So we calculated the amount of carbon that would be sequestered in vegetation using the full carbon accounting model which is available from um, the uh, Emissions Reductions Fund website for free um, and that I use the same process as you would were you claiming carbon credits through through the market. We calculated the uh, emission Kristen, your voice is not coming through there. Uh, 
So, yeah. okay, I'll just carry on because something's happened with uh, Kristen's voice. So we, we calculated the um, avoided emissions associated with um, displacement of dairy farming using data from the Dairy Farm Monitor Report. And that took into account the reduced livestock emissions. So as Kristen said, the, uh, you know, the enteric fermentation, which is the term, but also changes associated with, re, you know, with not uh, with manure management and with uh, the use of nitrogenous fertilizer as well. Okay, and so these are the numbers that we came up with in terms of the overall emissions. So the grey would be the certified emissions, and they were included in the um, in the financial analysis. And the blue on top of that would be the emissions associated with the um, emissions offsets associated with the flexible, which wouldn't be formally certified, but would be associated with those reduced agricultural emissions and changed energy uh, use uh, due to improved water quality. And all of those numbers, even for the 20 metre environmental planting, which is the lowest amount of sequestration, should be roughly sufficient to offset, to, to satisfy Warren and Water's um, projected um, offset requirements. Um, and then bringing all of those things together, you see sort of the numbers in terms of the amount of carbon offset and where they sit on a financial scale. Now, sort of, I'm, I need to sort of quickly work through the, the remainder of that. So um, given the time we've got available, so we developed this uh, a process to think through what the implications would be from a source water quality perspective thinking about the contribution of each of the subcatchments. So one of the, the working groups, Brad Klingen from One and Water had actually done a master's looking at the contribution of the, the catchment and uh, different catchments within the uh, jelly brand, how much they're contributing to the various water quality issues. We also thought about, well, what are the potential, the contribution of each of those causes to the overall problem? Uh, and what are the effects of each of the options on each aspect of that port, that cause? brought those together into an overall effect uh, estimation of the water quality effect and allowing the calculation to vary on based on the level of implementation, which gives us a sort of a, an overall contribution to the sort of effect on the, the causes of water quality. Now this graph assumes 100% implementation of the projects, which we considered in the overall evaluation, but you could actually, you know, it would be much, it would be likely that those Higher, larger scale land use options wouldn't actually get the 100% level of implementation and so the overall effect would be scaled back. Whereas the 20 metre buffer was actually considered to be quite plausible that you get you could get much of that implemented. We looked at river health and, and you know when you think about river health there's a number of different uh, attributes to that, physical form, street and side row, uh, zone, water quality and the like, much of which relates to the amount, uh, the, the level of connectivity of vegetation in that immediate stream side zone. And use it, you know, for depend, regardless of the method essentially, you know, all of the projects gave uh, about um, overall 13% increase in length of uh, waterway with connected vegetation. And so this, this slide is showing, so the pale blue along here is showing the new areas of connected ve native vegetation, the darker blue is showing areas with existing uh, native, connected native vegetation. And so the, the project as a whole added, um, added about 13% um, of connected vegetation for the catchment as a whole, recognising that most of the waterways actually in the catchment are already in, in forested areas. Terrestrial vegetation, we saw the value there again about connecting fragmented uh, remnants of native vegetation within that landscape. And you can see how, how the, the projects might connect. So the darker blue was the 20 metre buffer and they would con connect a certain amount of those dark green areas which were the disconnected islands of native vegetation and then the wider uh, 100 metre buffer would in some cases connect in some additional areas. And you can see in the, in the slide there that you know the the additional area of the, from the 20 meter, the 100 meter, and also the the, the floodplain only uh, component. So it, you know the project's connecting significant areas of native vegetation, but recognising too that that much of the the native vegetation, the catchment, it was already uh, connected in. 
We looked at river flows in the catchment, how that might change associated with uh, the addition of woody perennial vegetation, and that was estimated to range between about 0.4 and 2.7% of mean annual flow. We also included a, a socioeconomic analysis, so these were things for which we didn't have any clear way of assessing uh, based on a, some more uh, defined metrics. So we did a scoring essentially between minus four, so much worse than the, the existing condition under the base case, to plus four, much better. And so we assessed cultural, social values and, and bushfire risk. Now the cultural values were assessed based on what the, the steering, the working groups thought might be the kinds of things that influence cultural values, and really it was only considered to be a preliminary assessment. You know, you would clearly need to engage with the local indigenous community to actually get a, a thorough, a proper assessment of that. Social values based on on, on the, the kinds of attributes that would provide social value, so you know, access to for fishing and and improved values associated with recre you know, various recreational uh, uses, and then bushfire relating to the amount of additional um, vegetation in the landscape, recognising that the catchment is largely vegetated and any sort of additional native vegetation uh, would probably have a marginal impact on that. And so bringing those together, the, together, this graph sort of shows the, you know, the scoring for each of those elements, what are our cultural values, the social and recreational values and the change in the bushfire risk. And so the farm forestry options, because of, you know, they would be drier than the, a sort of native vegetation, um, probably exacerbating bushfire risks, but the others really not considered to change things very much at all. And then we included a governance analysis which related to two attributes, confidence in the level of implementation which related back to the likely community acceptance of the various models of activity versus the, you know, the, the engineered option which, you know, if that, a commitment was made to that then, you know, clearly that, that would be done and you, you would, it would be assumed to have be, be very effective. But also this aspect of the project about, you know, this concept of catchment carbon offsets being a collaborative concept, and what uh, whether they the project would develop community partnerships and the like, and so it was scored in this way with the the bar being that the level of implementation, with the engineer option rating high, but also the 20 meter option rating higher because of the um, the likely you know the lower much lower level of displacement of agricultural production there. And, and the uh, native edge options being the ones that would be seen to provide the strongest community partnerships. So they came together in an overall framework with the, the financial figure at the top, which we've discussed, and the various other aspects, the change in greenhouse gas emissions being only those that would relate to the flexible offsets and the various other dimensions there. And for time's sake, I, I won't go into those in detail. But looking at, you know, so I guess the, the, the 20 metre option being the most favourable financially, but in most other measures actually having quite significant environmental, socio-economic benefit, good confidence in its implementation and, and quite strong uh, sense that it can provide community and agency partnerships. So quickly in the, in the time sort of available, um, you know, I presented this slide at the start, and I guess what we found from the project is that those attributes of catchment carbon offset projects actually seem to work. You know, it would be possible to design a project to achieve these things, to have a strong carbon benefit in parts of the landscape, um, provide the other, in, you know, environmental or social benefits that would be resilient, stable. Uh, you could credibly measure and quantify and verify those offsets, but also tell a clear story about what those the other multi-benefit aspects would be. And the projects could be scalable up and down. We also found that there really was a place for both a certified and a flexible model, although the flexible model probably ended up being defined a bit differently to what we'd originally how we'd originally conceived. Of it. So certainly the, the certified benefits being carbon offsets where you could line those up with a, a clear emissions abatement method under the ERF or the NCOS. The flexible ones being, being 
emissions off abatement that would be real and measurable. So things like the reduced agricultural emissions being things that would actually appear in the state's emissions accounts, but not being things that, that could be claimed by water corporations under their under their pledges as part of the uh, their commitment to achieve uh, their net zero emissions targets. Another aspect is while it's possible under the ERF to have a 25 or 100 year permanence period, if you're going to, to actually satisfy the requirement to provide ongoing um, environmental and social benefits, then the projects would need to align around that sort of 100 year permanence period for the, for the carbon offset. You'd be looking for a permanent land use change. But definitely we saw that there was scope for those two models to be included in the concept. We felt in the end that, that sort of managed natural regeneration was a bit more complicated and probably didn't fit so well into the, into the story, uh, but certainly a place for both new environmental plantings and non-environmental plantings, harvested or, or unharvested. Again, the acceptability of that depending on the, the, the region noted and, and the existing land use. And while there was significant revenue generated by the, the farm forestry plantings, because it was displacing a high value land use, daring, uh, then, then it wasn't actually economic in its own right. Um, and that would differ from site to site. I guess you know a couple of sort of other outcomes and learnings from the project. Just quickly, one of the things that was I think really useful about the project is it, is it created this common language around the concept of catchment carbon offsets. You know there was a concept around it before, but I guess the project uh, was able to sort of define well what 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 might that mean. And, and the reality was that as it sort of ent the language around this was sort of entered into that sort of policy discussions that were happening within DELP uh, around, around this concept. And so, you know, it, it has been quite, you know, somewhat influential around the de development of policy and thought in the space. And, and I guess, you know, with new concepts, it really is valuable to have a common language around things. And I think we've been able to do that through the project, which, which is, is, is a useful thing. I think we've developed some models and options that are relevant to the needs of catchment management authorities and water corporations. And we, we can't guarantee that, that uh, a catchment carbon offset project is workable in every region. But I think we've developed a framework where that where the, a project can be designed and evaluated and decisions made as to whether it's it's actually workable. We've developed some tools that have been designed to, to help uh, parties design and evaluate the projects. They build on Australian Government carbon calculation tools. Um, they have generic application, although there's still a little bit of work which we're seeking funding for to, to actually develop the, uh, our financial evaluation tool so that it can be used by others. Uh, I think a really important lesson from the project was around the, this collaborative design. So the, the, the case study was a collaborative activity involving uh, representation from Water and Water, uh, Karangamite, Glen Oak, Hopkins, CMA. And that process was really important in designing and setting up a project that it could achieve the carbon offset benefits, but also other uh, benefits that were sought by the various parties in that process. If you were to really de look to deliver a catchment carbon offset project, we didn't in this case study, but if you were actually looking to implement a project, then obviously community input would be really important if the land on which the project is to be implemented is owned by private landholders, farmers and the like. And because we're focusing on, on sort of uh, immediate waterway environment land, you know, this certainly the concept could apply to crown water frontages. So I think there's still a, there's work going on in DELP in this space. Um, but those areas generally probably don't provide sufficient continuity, perhaps not enough area to have the, you know, for the project to be implemented on those areas alone. So we've developed some tools around this which are available in the project reports which talk about how to, to do these projects, defining the problem, identifying the legacy, designing the project, calculating the impacts and then crafting a narrative around the benefits and, and the costs of the projects. And as I said, we've, we're, we actually have a funding application at the moment to develop up the cost benefit analysis tool. 
uh, and the, the sort of overall project evaluation tool so that they can be much more readily used by people outside the scope of this initial case study. And that's an example of the tool, so I won't for time go into that now. And also down the track we're hoping, all, you know, perhaps if there's additional case studies to, to develop this sort of web-enabled tool such as Certi have developed for other projects where users could go onto this website and that would be a self-contained tool that will enable them to sort of design and evaluate the, the projects and link them with the data sources that would be, would be needed to do that. So I guess one of the things that we're interested in is, is you know, further case studies of the concept applied, you know, collaborative projects between CMAs and water corporations. So please contact Kate Brandt from Goulburn Broken CMA if you're interested in doing that. Um, I'm sure she'd be really happy to, uh, to hear from you and contacts for further information there. If you don't have a copy of our reports, uh, please contact Kate or Kristen or I and we can, we can get you a copy of those. So that's presentation, sorry it's taken an hour, there's not, we're, we're, so Kristen and I are available if you've got some more time to, to and you, you're wanting to ask questions, so please um, go ahead if you, you do. And thank you very much for your participation as well. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Excellent. Do have a question from Ash, which is um, why was the 20 metre buffer zero carbon dioxide emissions? Um, for the smaller project, we assumed that it wouldn't actually have any effect on the um, the farming, well, the, sorry, the, the ability of that farm to support the same number of cattle, whereas for the larger projects, we did assume that it would displace the cattle. So um, the zero, zero impact on carbon dioxide emissions um, yeah, is from no displaced cows. So an anecdotally in, in that catchment was that, you know, livestock having access to creeks is actually a, a problem for the farmer in that they, they end up losing, you know, livestock into the creeks, they break legs, they get stuck there, they die. And so it was seen as, as an advantage to fence those off and but by fencing it, the farmers would actually graze the rest of their property more intensively and and wouldn't uh, and so there wouldn't be a, a net reduction in the the number of livestock or you know the, the the actual financial benefit associated with farming but clearly if if you've got 100 meters or planting the whole of the floodplain you you couldn't actually do that and there would be a real impact on agricultural emissions and uh, value of production from um, grazing our tool also does incorporate um, the provision of off-stream water for remaining cattle. Are there any further questions? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's David Buntine here. Hi, David. Hi, Craig. Hi, Tristan. Thanks for that. Um, just a couple of things, if, if I could. I'm just trying to get my head around it. One of the, um, the things we've found in the past with um, trying to get landholders to agree to these sorts of long-term contracts is that they're very, very reluctant. Um, we have had a few in the past with some tree planting projects, but on the main, uh, not many landholders are prepared to enter into long-term contracts like that. They're much more prepared to enter into short-term flexible contracts. So I'm, I'm wondering how you factored in um, into the, uh, you know, the likelihood that, that, that these targets would be achieved, um, how you factored in the sort of the agreement of landholders and what, what sort of inducements, incentives would be needed to have a, li a landholder you know, lock up that piece of land for perpetuity. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question, David. And um, there's there's you know part so part of it we 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 it's a good question and illustrates a really complex thing. And I, I guess in the case study, partly we've tried to simplify some of those things. So there's a, there's a number of points in which it's addressed. So in in the governance analysis, we we looked at you know what level of implementation was likely to be achieved 
by the various options and very clearly the option involving planting the the you know the near riparian environment the 20 meters would be much easier to achieve than planting 100 because the amount of you know land taken up would be less the, the impact on the the farm and and agricultural production would be less so that aspect was and and, and reflecting anecdotal evidence that you know the the at least in some cases, farmers are actually quite willing not to, to have to manage that, that land. Um, the the cost-benefit analysis took into account the sort of range of costs and benefits streams. And so it considered the, you know, the, the benefits, you know, the financial benefits from farm forestry, the financial benefits from carbon, and, uh, and the relative costs of that. And so while within a project where you're looking to, to get uh, landholders involved, you would need within that to work out how you, you're likely to, to vary the cost and benefit sharing. Now, while it may not affect the overall number in the, in the financial analysis, you know, who, who pays what and who receives what benefits would be very important in, in the overall analysis process. Uh, so that I, I guess, you know, the sharing of that would be one way, you know, it's not sort of explicitly considered in how we've done it, but it, that would be a very important feature. Um, the another feature of the offsetting framework is that you can actually, while, while we would recommend it against it from the long-term environmental benefit point of view, but you could actually run the project as a 25-year with a 25-year permanence period, which may still be considered to be long-term from a farmer's perspective. You can do that. It does involve some discounting the amount of carbon that's uh, calculated as being sequestered, but that would be another way that you could demonstrate that you're not locking a landholder into a, a sort of a, a permanent change in, in land use. Um, but I, I, so um, I think you know I recognise that it's it's a very important feature particularly where you, you know, unless you're carrying a, an activity out solely on land that's owned by a party, so a water corporation, then clearly you need to negotiate with the landholders, get them on board at scale to achieve the sorts of outcomes you're after. And, and we're certainly not underestimating the, the scale of that. We included in our costing um, a project management cost, and part of that was the process of actually going out uh, and recruiting landholders to participate in the project. Uh, so we did incorporate that as a feature, recognising that that would it's you know you don't get it just by saying a project's starting. You've got to actually go out and and work at them. But it, like you know we you know having said all of those things, recognising the challenge, and I don't think we've you know we've one hundred percent addressed all the issues that you've raised, David, because it's it's a long-standing challenge in in this field. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, and I, I, I agree. I think it's a, just an area we might want to um, consider some more as we sort of work off the back of this project and start to think about how these arrangements might move into the future. Because, like a dairy farmer, for example, they're they're managing risks every day associated with their, you know, what's going to happen on their farm and prices and all of the rest of it. But to for them to change from that area of risk management that they're quite familiar with to be going into a market where they might be getting payments based on um, carbon sequestered is a whole new area of risk and, and it would be easy, easy for us to underestimate the, the time and the effort and the incentive needed to, to have them willingly enter into that sort of arrangement, I think, especially for a long term. Um, that's why I'm, I'm sort of interested in the, 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 not the certified one, but the flexible carbon arrangement that you've talked about. And I, I, I just am wondering whether that's a fert, that's fertile ground for us, so to speak, because I think we would be able to get a lot more landholders to go into some sort of, uh, some sort of arrangement for a sh um, that may end up being long-term but doesn't lock them in and for which they might end up getting revenue based on the amount of, of carbon sequestered by their property. Uh, and therefore paid for by the potentially by the water authority um, offset payments. Is that, do you see that as um, an area that we should be doing some more work on? 
you know, the, the, David, the, the very reasons you, you, you talked about there were why we kept the flexible offset concept in the project and carried it through to the case study. Um, because we wanted to explore where, whether there was some other way other than or in addition to the sort of formal certification process. Uh, and, and so I guess where, where that ended up or where it's ended up at the moment is under the statement of obligation. The offsets that, that water corporations need are those which are, um, if not certifiable, not, not if not certified, but certifiable under the, the um, National Carbon Offset Standard. And so, um, you know, I, I guess the flexibility is good and it may help to re recruit landholders, but we, you know, if, if the offsets are to be purchased by water corporations or others, other organisations and there may be others interested in the market, they, they need a, a level of, of, of certainty that the certified type of offset provides um, and that the flexible offset may not provide. And so where we ended up landing, I think, with a flexible offset, it's, it's a way of dem demonstrating benefit to Victoria that may add to the stream of benefits that you might want to compensate landholders for. Uh, that there would be a payments related to the carbon that would be offset, and and uh, but then also payments for for the other benefits. And at the moment, we the the costing or the financial model doesn't consider payments for those other benefits, but they could in, be included, incorporated into the overall evaluation process, so that you get a clear picture of what it would actually cost to deliver the project that you're after and get the benefits that you're looking for from it. So in summary, I think you know, there's certainly scope for the flexible offsets, but I think if we're looking for water corporations to be participants in the project, which is a key part of you know, the, the catchment carbon offset thing, then the, the project does need to, to have a pretty strong focus on certified types of offsets. Uh, yeah, unless we can get the statement of obligations changed at some stage in the future to enable a proportion of their carbon offsets to be flexible rather than certified, potentially. P potentially, yeah. yeah. That's, oh, that's okay. I mean, the, the policy is is what it is at the moment, and 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 I guess the other thing to point out is that that. Under our definition, flexible off offsets are not just some dodgy number that someone cooks up. They are actually real uh, and credible emissions reductions that would appear in, in the state's greenhouse accounts. And so, you know, that aspect is really important to emphasise that, that they are real. Uh, verif even if you don't go through that sort of verification and auditing process, they actually could be determined with a reasonable map amount of robustness and would be attributable. So, you know, you know the, the, the flexible offsets, and I know you're not sort of suggesting it, but the flexible offsets are actually real and credible things and, and not sort of a, a just a, a really dodgy, dodgy thing. And so that may, may provide a basis for change of policy into the future. Yeah, that's, thanks for the discussion. Appreciate it tonight. Great. Yeah. So is that Sorry. you, Julie? Yes, yeah, speaking. Go ahead. So we, we had one question, which was what would be the impact on the NPV if the carbon offset was retained um, and made available for water authority um, and not sold? Julie, it doesn't affect the NPV at all because the, the NPV is just calculating the flow, the, the, uh, the flow of costs and benefits. Uh, who, who retains them? Doesn't really matter. We've just attributed a cost based on eleven tons per eleven dollars per ton. Um, so if they're retained by the water corporation or by one water or so on sold, it doesn't really make any difference to the equation. Um, Sorry, Craig. Don't don't you lose the revenue stream? No, no, because it, it's based on the value of the credit. It's not based on the recipient of that. So, it, like, if if one and water or another water corporation is looking to offset its emissions, so it's it's buying them and it would buy them for for whatever the cost might be. So, um, it's just considered to be 
a revenue stream. It's not you don't have to sort of attribute it to one source or another. So I guess the issue is that we're not able to buy offset. In this case, we're generating them alongside other water quality benefits. Yeah. And we would extinguish that carbon no dollar value associated. So it just depends on how you do the accounting. I appreciate the way that you're describing it. Yeah. I think we would need to describe that differently. Okay. Yeah, it's also important to note that all of the options um, off offset, well, sequestered more carbon than one on water's offset requirements. So you would have the option of sale, selling of the extra credits if you wanted. Yeah. I think this option generated 7,000 tons a year on average, is that correct? Uh, yeah, and the, our assumptions. I think the, the 20 metre generated about just under 8,000 tonnes on average. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the, there was a, a slide earlier on that had um, income generated from, uh, from carbon credits. Uh, that might be helpful. Go back to that slide. Up in the 1.2. Yeah, in providing it. Yeah, that's probably the right number. And if those take that in. Is that the one you're thinking about, Julie? No, I'll go back. It's when Kristen presented. Um, oh. What income would you get if you just um, counted it? Tree planting is business as usual, and this. Oh yeah, sorry, that one, that one. Okay. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, that one point. Yeah, and and so by like if if a CMA or a water corporation were to just do a conventional environmental planting type project, um, it would cost a certain amount. Um, but if you add you know, just adding participation in a carbon market into the process, it, it entails costs, but it generates revenues. And so the net value from the 20 metre planting, environmental planting option over the 50 year period would be about a million, a million dollars and, and more for the, the larger scale planting projects, which is based on, on that $11 of ton, $11 of ton, a ton value for the carbon. Thank you. So it's a value generated rather than not necessarily, you know, you're attributing a value as a revenue. I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Okay. Did you hear that? Thanks very much for your presentation, Craig and Kristen. It was really, really good. Okay, thank you. Any, um, we'll sort of finish up in a in a sec, if there, unless there are any other questions. Okay. Well, um, our email addresses were there. If you haven't yet got a copy of the reports, um, then please feel free to contact Kate, Kristen, or myself. Uh, happy to provide them to you, and um, and if you're definite, if you're interested in this, and I think you know there's plenty of scope for exploring these sorts of things in in other case studies. Then please, uh, as I said, get get in touch with Kate and and work out a way, try and work out a way in which that that might happen. I'm sure she'd be very pleased to uh, talk to you. And uh, you know, just, just again, just thank uh, the steering committee for their support through the project, particularly Kate for the ideas and, and just keeping everything on track and also for the working group from One and Water, Karinga, Mike and Glen Elcock and CMA for their involvement in the project as well. So thanks so much for everyone um, calling in. Uh, it's uh, an interesting experience talking to a crowd of people that you can't actually see, but uh, hopefully it went okay for you all. Uh, thanks very much. Catch you sometime soon.